looks like we are good to go. Um, so again, welcome everyone to It's Worth a Shot. We are going to be talking about the Wyoming culture change today. Um, let's go ahead and go to the next slide. We just have some updates for you guys. Um, we've sent out the updated infection control playbook. This is our baseball themed playbook and it has um, updated resources and um, links to updated information, both from the CDC and different Mountain Pacific information that we have. And then on the infection prevention quick guide and checklist, that is another great resource, especially for our new infection preventionists. So take a look at that. The cohorting and visitation policy templates have also been updated. They are available on the website. We had some issues with the cohorting policy link, but that has been corrected as of yesterday. So if you tried it before and you weren't able to get in, it should be corrected and you guys should be able to access that now. And then just as a reminder, we do have our partners from HSAG that are doing an emergency preparedness webinar. That is actually today, um, just this afternoon. So don't forget to hop on there. Today, they are going to be talking about care coordination and surge. So that should be a good, a good training, and especially for our nursing home partners. So let's go ahead and go to the next slide. Okay, um, as a reminder, um, if you guys have any topics that you would like us to talk about, um, just make sure you guys put those in the chat. And then we have our evaluation. So don't forget to complete the evaluation and let us know if there's any topics you guys want to talk about on that as well. And we will continue to meet every Wednesday. And the um, event evaluation is in the chat for you guys. So we are going to have a quick polling question. Okay. How are you providing education to your staff about COVID-19 vaccines? So if you guys would just take a minute to complete that. Okay, it looks like most of you guys are doing all of the above staff meetings upon hire and upon demand. Um, so that is good. Okay, we'll go ahead and go on to the next slide, please. Okay. Um, on this, so just some updates on our COVID hospitalizations, deaths, and emergency visits, um, as well as vaccinations. We have seen improvement on all three of those different metrics from our last It's Worth a Shot. So that's good. Um, let's go ahead and go to the next slide. And if you'll note that our last meeting, we had some yellow in Wyoming. And so now we are all green in our region. So we are doing good. There continues to be just a couple little hot spots in Texas. Um, but again, overall improvement. So let's go ahead and go to the next slide. And I would like to introduce Carmen Bowman. She is with the Wyoming Culture Change, Change Coalition. And I will go ahead and turn it over to Carmen. Thanks, Carmen, for being on the call with us today and sharing your work. Carmen, I think you're on mute. We can't hear you. Can you hear us? Hello. OK, we can hear you now. Here we go. <laughs> Hi, everyone. Thanks for having me today. Um, let's see, will you have to advance probably for me, please? Uh, so my name is Carmen Bowman. It's been my privilege to get to be a part of a three-year grant in Wyoming. And it's it's uh, one of the CMP Civil Money Penalty Reinvestment Projects. Um, 
And the grant has several arms to it, if you will. One is to uh, support the Wyoming Culture Change Coalition. And that's very exciting, by the way, that you have a coalition. Not every state does. Uh, in fact, in our history, a 30 year history now, at our highest point, we had 43 culture change coalitions. Isn't that wonderful? Um, but now it's down to 20 and it might be 21 and you guys might be actually number 21, which is kind of um, kind of cool that you started a coalition during COVID. Congratulations, Wyoming. Um, we also have free monthly education. Hopefully you all know about and I'll show you on a slide what our next one is, but it's usually the last Friday of the month. We want free education for people to learn what it means to change institutional culture. I also get to work with five nursing homes individually each year. I just got off a call with Amy Holt, and I just got off a call before that with Bighorn and Tierden. And um, it's my joy to get to work with teams to implement at least three practices. And by the way, no one ever just sticks with three. <laughs> uh, I think Star Valley did 12 in their year with me, and then they implemented 12 more. How cool is that? Um, and I also get to do an annual culture change conference. The first one became an online conference because of COVID. The next year was supposed to be five regional workshops, and because they didn't take place, we now have five very special uh, really many documentaries of five Wyoming nursing homes, which I'll tell you more about toward the end. And we also have our first in-person conference coming up in August. So I'll have a slide on that as well. So next slide, please. Um, we have two big audacious goals, as they say, and that is our goal is that anyone working in a Wyoming nursing home learns about culture change. So if you happen to have any impact on people working in nursing homes in Wyoming, would you please help us get the word out for everything I'm telling you? And then the next big goal is actually for anyone living in a Wyoming uh, nursing home would actually not be woken up and their sleep would be honored. They would get the restorative sleep, which helps our bodies to heal. And that's, our, that's a big goal, isn't it? So we could use your help. Next slide, please. We, we use the Artifacts of Culture Change tool, which actually came out originally in 2006. I was very fortunate to be a subcontractor. CMS Division of Nursing Homes actually funded it, which is a big deal, um, and gave it to the public to use for free. So that's what we refer to as the original, if you wouldn't mind um, advancing. The reason we call it Artifacts, if you think of the culture that went before us, we we look for, we find, we carefully use brushes even not to disturb these precious artifacts that were proof of a culture that once existed. So that's kind of our idea here are these, these are proofs, these are tangible, these are practices that, that show this home has elements of a change culture, not so institutional, becoming more home, less institution. So we have a lot of artifacts of institution out there. We're trying to implement more and more artifacts of home. That's uh, another way to think of it. And it, go ahead and advance. It's purposely not an uh, interview tool with residents simply because that takes a lot of time and most homes already do that. So then uh, we got a grant and worked on this during COVID. Uh, another CMP uh, grant actually from Maryland to devise a 2.0 version. And we're using that in the project. That's why I'm bringing it up. Uh, the homes I work with use this tool. And uh, we call it, uh, first of all, an educational tool. If you've never really heard about culture change, you could learn a lot by just reading the 134 practices. It's also um, an inspirational tool. Hopefully, as you read and learn about these beautiful practices, you're going to have to implement some of them and some are really easy. Some are quicker than others. Um, we also then refer to it as an inspirational tool, um, but you can use it as a benchmarking tool. I, we recommend annually that you might complete it because you'll probably see your scores improve. Um, and it's a self-assessment tool. You do it as a, as a group. If you wouldn't mind on the next slide, one thing we've learned is don't let, um, it might be the next slide, 
yes, don't let just like one person, sometimes it's tempting, the administrator wants to fill it out, but it's meant to be done community-wide. So you have agreement that that practice is in place or not. And if you go back one, uh, and if you look close at the, at the tool, we have a column that says uh, fully implemented. We have a column that's partially implemented. And then we have a column that's not implemented. And I like to add yet. So it's a rolling uh, tally of fully or partially implemented or not implemented. By the way, we also developed a tool for assisted living. It's basically the same tool. We just cut out a few nursing home specific things and added a few assisted living uh, words, to be honest. Uh, so if you go to slide now, thank you. Um, we want you also to be aware that the tool has now been uh, validated by a researcher and it has been published in a peer review international journal. We're very proud of that. On the next slide, um, I'd like to just kind of preface uh, what I'm gonna come into next here. I'd like y'all to look at the language. Uh, if someone moves out of their home and has to move somewhere else, where do they go? Independent, what's it called? Independent living. And then maybe they need more assistance and what, where do they move to? Yeah. Assisted, they, what? Yeah. Assisted living. Yeah. And then like maybe they need, um, maybe they need care and where do they move? Long-term care, post-acute care, skilled nursing facility. Uh, if you wouldn't mind clicking, please. What we like to say next is, where did the living go? Isn't that sad? So even if, um, even, not even if, but even in the language, the word living disappears. I think that could be part of the issue. How about you? On the next slide, um, I love saying, let's keep the living in assisted living. There's really no reason to refer to assisted living facilities. Do you see that? The word facility we've learned is very institutional. It, it does not speak of home. A school is a facility. And why? Because nobody lives there. Isn't that ironic? So it's keep the living in assisted living and keep the home in nursing home. Next slide, please. Uh, in the CMS definitions, when the new regs came out in 16, they gave they put forth a, a definition of person-centered care. I'd love for you to see this. It means to focus on the resident as the locus of control and support the resident in making their own choices and having control over their daily lives. Woo, is that not good? That's what I want. How about you? And to be honest, I've kind of come to think that doesn't actually describe care. I think it describes life. And so the point here that I'm trying to make is that person-centered care is, is actually outdated. I'll show you in a minute. And it's not the same thing. It's not everything. There's a culture here that care is a part of, but culture change is not the same thing as person-centered care. Even in our movement, some people kind of just stop talking about culture and they just talk about person-centered care. I think because it got such a big showing in the regs, but just remember care is only part of life. And what people, what they kind of need us to focus on is the lives that they're living and not just the care that they're receiving. Um, so on the next slide here, I'll show you that person-centered is good, right? It's good. But what, what would be better? Person-directed. And even if I have dementia, always try to help the person direct their life. Defer to them. Always ask them. Even with dementia, people can answer, people can nod, people can look at what they want. And don't forget, those who work closest to these beautiful people, they know. They know things like, oh, she'll spit out her green beans. Don't give her green beans. <laughs> they know. And, and never discount what your direct caregivers know about people. So that's another way to say person directed. Uh, next slide. So if you could go quickly, so we say person directed what and resident directed what, go ahead. Instead of care, we're now moving into, uh, if you could do the next one, please. Uh, what's missing here? Hopefully you can tell the next one, please. <laughs> they got a little mixed up there. The next one, please. 
uh, in our movement, we had already referred to self-directed life and living or resident-directed life and living or person-directed life and living. You know, you're self-directing your life and so am I. And we are going to want to do that our whole life, even if I live with dementia. So person-centered care is really outdated. And I'd love to invite all of you to help change culture and talk more about the life that people are living. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so one of the practices under in our movement and even in the artifacts tool under the section called resident directed life um, has is, is called like um, we call it open dining. So technically the artifact reads each meal is available for at least two hours and residents can come and go when they choose. And in the artifacts tool, we end up um, we end up referring to 27 different regulations from CMS for a total of 52 times. Now, it doesn't mean you do this and you will naturally be compliant, like we can't guarantee it, but our point is these regs support these practices. And um, the tag number is, uh, let's see, some of this is mixed together here. So the first bullet is an artifact. Artifact number two, but then the next text is CMS tag 809, frequency of meals. Um, and I wanna show you how the regs support open dining. Um, many of us learned this as the 14 hour rule and it's really kind of weird. Uh, in fact, <laughs> I wanted the 16 hours to be highlighted. Um, so instead of learning it as the 14 hour rule, watch this, we all should have learned it as the 16 hour rule. These are not new regs, what I'm gonna read you. In fact, this is a long sentence. All the regulation regs tend to be one big long sentence. So it goes like this. There must be no more than 14 hours between a substantial evening meal and breakfast the following day, except when a nourishing snack is served at bedtime, up to 16 hours may elapse between a substantial evening meal and breakfast the following day if a resident group agrees to the meal span. Wow, we all should have learned it as the 16 hour rule. Most nursing homes do offer nourishing snacks at bedtime. It's like a done deal. And do you suppose most residents would agree to a wider time span if it also honors choice in ways choice has never been honored before. So if you look at the sign, breakfast from six to nine, lunch 11 to one, dinner 4.30 to 6.30. If you look at the end of supper and the beginning of breakfast, in almost any scenario, guess what? The very end and the very beginning, in between there, it's always within 14 hours. And what, what people don't realize is now you've honored choice more than ever before. There's a lot, a lot, a lot of regs on choice. We're gonna look at them next here, please. So let's keep track, someone help me. How many regs on choice? So forgive me, I never mean to read to people, but I also like people to see the reg. So did you know, if you lived in a nursing home, you have the right to be informed in advance by physician or other practitioner of what? Of risks and benefits of proposed care. Look at these choice words, everyone, of treatment and treatment alternatives or treatment options and to choose the alternative or option they prefer. Oh my gosh, that is straight out of our movement. That is new in the reg as of 16. Risks and benefits knowing that there's options, there's pros and cons, and the person decides in the end. The next one, residents have the right to request, refuse, or discontinue treatment. Whoa, the next one, the right to choose schedules. It also says the right to make choices about aspects of their life that are significant to them. So there's three so far. Next slide, please. It goes on. Residents also have, uh, should be treated with respect and dignity, uh, maintaining their quality of life, recognizing each resident's individuality. Don't you love that? And then in the same tag, did you know it's, goes on to say that anyone living in a nursing home has the very same rights as any U.S. citizen. Whoa, that's you and me. And it goes on to say that nursing homes should protect and promote a person's rights. That is profound. It never used to say protect and promote. 
Why do you suppose it says it now? Because we haven't been that great at that. We have not been great at protecting rights and even promoting rights. Woo! Let's turn the corner together, everybody. And then under tag 692, it also brings up the language of informed choice. In our culture change movement, we glommed onto this. We highly recommend it. Every time you say both words together, informed choice. Hey, did we give her her informed choice? What is her informed choice? We do the informing, the person gets to do the choosing. So if you want mine, next slide, please. Uh, also under menus, check this out. Oh my gosh. So menus must reflect based on, um, I can't say the F word, based on the nursing home's reasonable efforts, the religious, the cultural, and the ethnic needs of the resident population, as well as input received from residents and any resident group. So menus should reflect religious, cultural, ethnic needs. And my favorite part, Nothing in this paragraph should be construed to limit the resident's right to make personal dietary choices. See, it used to be that sometimes homes got cited for not, not giving Carmen milk because it was on the menu. Well, guess what? I can't drink milk. So this, this reminds us nothing on a menu or even in this reg, in this paragraph of this regulation should be construed to limit the residents' right to make choices about what they eat and what they don't eat. Very strong. Next slide, please. And then I just want to bring up uh, something from the, the dining practice standards. So forgive me, there's too much to cover in our short time, but um, we had a big symposium and then we had a big task force and we developed what are called the dining practice standards. You can get them at my website. You can get them at the Pioneer Network website. You can just look them up. And basically, this document is helping us as professionals to help people who live in nursing homes eat what they want to eat. And one of the sections of our standards is called Real Foods First. And I just love sharing um, that. Um, see, these actually these these um, sentences actually come out of the artifacts tool. Um, these are practices that are considered culture change practices. So before commercial supplements are used, real foods are offered, such as smoothies, shakes, and malts. So moving away from so much supplement use will save you money, and you can give people yummy things to eat. Um, another artifact is that the home adheres to the dining practice standards. And then something that we put in the standards, we're quoting the American Medical Directors Association here is that the, the physicians are encouraging us to provide foods of a consistency and texture that allow comfortable chewing and swallowing. A resident who has difficulty swallowing may reject pureed or artificially thickened foods, but they might eat foods that are naturally of a pureed consistency. Um, finely chopped foods may retain flavor and be equally well handled. So the physicians reminded us that there's a longer list of yummy foods that are naturally pureed. I could eat guacamole with a spoon. How about you? I could eat refried beans with a spoon. How about you? And to grow the list beyond the typical applesauce and yogurt and mashed potatoes, we can mash a lot of things. We can have lots of fruit that turns into a sauce like applesauce, um, et cetera, et cetera. And then also that chicken, that a a breast of chicken finely chopped, people tend to do better with that than all the grinding. And then the grinding makes things drier, and that's why we add all the gravy. Um, it also creates another place for infection control to be an issue. So next slide, please. Um, I was just asked to highlight some of these uh, dining practices and regs, um, but um, if you want to learn more, we have these five mini documentaries now in Wyoming. Uh, Westward Heights, I highly recommend maybe going to them first only because they have experienced some profound outcomes. The retention rate is higher. They don't need the overtime. They aren't using bonuses. They have no job openings. Speaking of food, they've done open dining. They basically make people what they want when they want it. And 
the dietitian who has worked there for seven years now says we had no weight loss for the first time in seven years. But all the rest of these homes are also doing open dining. Uh, Star Valley, Life Care of Casper, Morning Star, Mission at Castle Rock. Highly recommend. Please go watch these guys. Uh, and way to go, Kathy Clark's on the line from Westward Heights. Next slide, please. Um, our conference is coming up. If you know of someone that could come or you aren't coming yet, it's our first and only in these three years in-person conference. It's one day. It's being held at the Inn at Lander. It's free. And um, uh, I'm, I'm getting to teach along with Linda Shell, and we're covering uh, restorative sleep leadership by all, no matter who you are, and how to engage families as partners. We're also going to do a lot with language, changing institutional language and play a game all day to that end. Uh, the conference is from nine to four. And next slide, please. Um, our next free webinar is next Friday, July 28th. They're always at 2 p.m. Mountain Time. And it will be, I'll be covering Culture Change 101 the principles uh, to change institutional culture. Watch for a registration link. And that might be all my slides. Aha, questions. Thank you for having me, everyone. Thank you for being on, Carmen. Does anyone have any questions for Carmen today? We do have an audience that covers Montana, Alaska, and Hawaii. Um, if somebody from, let's say, Montana wanted to come to the conference, the in-person conference, would that be an issue or is this strictly just for Wyoming? Hmm, that is a good question. Because sometimes they do get kind of strict, but okay. I don't know the answer. So if anyone really wants to come, please just reach out to me and we'll, we'll find out, okay? Okay, it doesn't look like there's any other questions. So just as a reminder, um, please complete the evaluation for today's call. Um, we appreciate you guys' feedback and we will see you next Wednesday. Um, Holly is wondering, is it possible to send this PowerPoint? She would love to share the story with the Director of Nursing and Dietary. Um, we will share out the Mountain Pacific PowerPoint we also um, have Carmen's PowerPoint that she originally sent us. We can send the full deck because that was a little bit more um, material. So that way um, we had to condense it a bit to make sure it fit within our time frame. But we can send both. If, if that's okay with you, Carmen, then we uh -huh. can send both of the slide decks out. Perfect. Hey, thank you for that, Carmen. We you appreciate bet. that information. And then also next week, we will have Terry Hewlett on for um, the Infection Control Committee and Infection Control Risk assessment, so ICAR. So if you guys would like to see that next week, definitely um, join us for the next uh, webinar. All right, well, that concludes for today. Thank you guys all for attending. And again, thank you, Carmen, for presenting for us. We appreciate you. Yeah. And we will see you guys all next week. Have a great Bye. day. Yep. Bye.